Um, so if I could convene up the panelists for the first session, which is on the student researcher perspective. And I'd like to introduce you here, who's up right beside me, Professor Sean O'Connor, who's flown in to be with us as well today. He comes from the University of Washington in Seattle, and he is the director of the Law, Business, and Entrepreneurial Clinic there. And also, uh, his clinic is a partner on the Partnership Development Grant. So that's one of those grants that I was talking to you about that I'm working on with, uh, through SHRC. So uh, welcome, uh, Sean. Um, I'd also, if we were at Canadian Music Week, which we were at last night, uh, the way I was introducing him was as a musician and a band member, because so that's, he's multi-talented. So uh, with that, uh, Professor O'Connor will kick off the first session. Thank Great, you. Great, thanks. Thanks, Pina. Uh, I just can't say enough about uh, Pina, and we've, uh, we've known each other for a number of years now, and um, you know, I think all is good law is just so fortunate to have her in the IP community here. I mean, I, I'm known as a fairly active, busy guy, but uh, she dwarfs whatever I do. It's just amazing how much she gets done. Uh, uh, and she always puts on great events. So I just want to thank uh, Michelle and Mary for, for organizing everything today and for getting me here. Uh, I appreciate that as well. Uh, it's going to be a great session today. And uh, the first panel, I think this is smart that we kick it right off with not necessarily students now. Well, one of you is a law student currently, right? Yeah. That's me. Uh, but what we have is, is three professionals who have uh, done a lot of entrepreneurial and commercialization activities, and they've done some of those while they were students. And so this is quite fitting that we start off the day with them talking about their experiences as being students interfacing with the university and faculty and trying to then push an idea that they had through the commercialization process. So our three panelists, I'll just give their names first, and then as each of them speaks, then I'll, I'll give the fuller introduction. So we have uh, directly to my right, Dr. Raziai Niazi, uh, and then to her right, Dr. Udo Verkek, and then last but not least, Pasan Haparachi. That's right. Okay. Uh, and so as a way of prefacing uh, their comments, uh, as Pina mentioned too earlier, that students, you know, uh, fulfill all sorts of different roles. And we need to make sure that when we're thinking about students in the university research ecosystem, that we're realizing that you have undergrad students, you have graduate students, you have postdocs and fellows, and they're all in very different uh, situations. At the same time, their pursuits can be quite different. Some may be coming in and really pursuing a basic research kind of agenda, right? That's what they want to do. Others may be very focused on applied fields and engineering. And so that will change a little bit their perspectives. Uh, and then you also have the, the um, I don't want to call it the serendipitous inventor, because that, that's misleading, but the um, student who is inventing something that's not necessarily part of their degree program. So there's a lot of different inventive activities that can be going on for the students. And one of the things we want to ferret out today, I think, is what should be the university's relationship and role in helping to foster that. I think we all agree that fostering that kind of enthusiasm and ingenuity is something we want to do. And seeing it through to fruition and commercialized uh, uh, goods and services is very good for economic development. So let's start off now with Dr. Razia Niazi. Uh, her background is, well, currently she's uh, founder and CEO of KPOC, which is uh, becoming a big success story. Right? Uh, experienced entrepreneur from Iran and uh, came to Canada, uh, feeding back there a little bit, uh, as an immigrant and continued her master's study at Guelph University as her PhD uh, in computer science from York. Uh, and um, basically the uh, KPOC project was helped through its commercialization with the Mars Innovation Center. So I want to turn it over to Dr. Niazi now to talk about her experiences. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for having me today here. Uh, I'm Razia Niazi, and uh, I apologize I'm for doctor because I haven't gotten my PhD yet, and I explained there is an actually, just today morning I realized that they actually there is a, they put it labeled doctor, and really apologize, I didn't notice before. But this is one of the concerns actually that I want to uh, address it today. Uh, uh, first, I explain uh, about KPOC Incorporation. KPOC uh, commercialized uh, 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 through York University in partnership with Mars Innovation, and Mars Innovation invested for 400K on this company. Uh, 
Uh, KPOC provides the next level of data understanding. It means that it is uh, able to analyze massive amount of data from social media uh, data, blogs from any kind of unstructured text, and provide the meaning behind the massive amount of text and identify when, what, who, where, why, how, and why of any text. So basically, you can identify what people like or don't like about product or service and what is the reason or why they like or don't like something. Uh, uh, in my 10, 10 minutes presentation, I would like to address this, how my work was started. Actually, my work started as a course project in data mining course, just a course project, and I've done uh, I, I provided, I developed a prototype for final project in data mining course to get just a mark. The project was about sentiment analysis algorithm, and basically in sentiment analysis algorithm, you identify what is people's opinion about a topic or about a subject, whether it is positive or negative. <laughs> my supervisor, Professor Sercone, and my uh, professor in data mining course, Professor Ajun, they liked my project and encouraged me to validate my algorithm. I validated my algorithm after, and after two months, I got a better result of all other competitors. At the same time, there was a CIVDD project, a multi-million dollars project uh, between York University, U of D, and uh, I believe OCAD University, and industrial partners. Um, was led by York University, and actually, I can say that I got insight to the market through this project. I really appreciate York University and my advisor that I, I think was the main PI in this project. My advisor encouraged me to go to all meetings that we had with industrial partners because they brought their issue that they really had in uh, market to the university to address it by university researchers. And I found out what is the major issue. One of the industrial partners were, was RBC, and they had problem with root cause analysis. And basically, when I heard about this problem, I was really interested in to solve this problem. So basically, I worked on it, and finally, I came up with k Park Corporation. Uh, how, the pro, how the commercialization, commercialization process get done? Uh, first, I uh, filled out a non-disclosure form, and then we had a meeting with Sarah Howe, uh, director at Innovation York, and then I was introduced to Hassan Jeffrey. They did a great job, actually. They provided all of the information that I needed, and whenever I need or, or I had any question, uh, they were available for me, and they explained about the IP, the choices that I have, and how the commercialization process get done. I remember Hassan uh, Jeffrey provided a long list of patents, around 200 patents, and consider each patent is like 30 to 50 pages, and uh, he asked me to identify the differentiation between my work and all of the competitors in the market space. Oh my goodness, it took one month to read all of the patent and providing a comprehensive document identifying the dif differentiation. And I was really involved in this process because I know differentiation is very important if you want to commercialize your project or your invention. Uh, then, uh, actually, we, they submitted the proposal and the, all of the review and document, and then York University, York University decided uh, to commercialize my application. And they gave me three options. One was commercialization is done just by York University, or it is done by York University through partnership with Mars Innovation, or the third option was York University through partnership with Mars Discovery District. I decided to commercialize the application through York University in partnership with Mars Innovation. I, I have several concerns, and still I have, con, still I have some of the concerns. One of the concerns that I had in this process was who owns the IP, and who controls the work, or who controls the company later, and I still have this concern. Uh, the other issue that I had was, uh, how do, evaluate, uh, how do I evaluate the IP agreement or 
if we go further in commercialization process, uh, convertible debenture or shareholder agreement, I really need, and still I feel, always need, feel that I need someone uh, beside me or like a lawyer that can help me in these matters. And I have several discussions with Sarah Ho about this matter that, uh, for, for example, shareholder agreement, you want to share your company and the equity with other people, really you need someone to help you. And as a student, really it's very difficult to get lawyer for yourself because of the cost. Uh, the other concern that I had was what would be the patent strategy, whether we should select, you, you should, we should have US patent or Canadian patent or inter, international patent, and it's very costly if you want to cover all, you know, all patents. The other concern that I had and I still have is how commercialization affect my academia, my academia life. Actually, as a PhD student, I had to publish, uh, I, have, I have to have publications. And the other issue that I have is that in the patent that I did, I didn't put my sacred sauce. Actually, the patent, that, the patent strategy that we chosen was just patenting the business model. And I didn't put any algorithm on my patent, so basically I never can publish my book, and based on my opinion, I never can get my PhD. Basically, this is the matter that I should cover it later. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, that's, uh, and we'll come back and do some questions for each of the panels. I want to follow up on your on your last point in particular, uh, the tensions about being a commercialized entrepreneur and sure. finishing your degree program. <laughs> okay, so now I want to turn it over to Dr. Udo Verkek, uh, who has a master's in science in organic chemistry, pharmacochemistry, uh, toxicology, and a PhD in organometallic chemistry. Uh, he was very interested in the commercialization process, and I think has a somewhat different perspective on what's going on, and I think has some ideas about how there could be some tensions uh, between the faculty and the students. And I think that's something we want to get at today, is how we can uh, improve that relationship. So, Dr. Furke. Yeah. yeah, so I made some slides, and I will treat oh, basically great. everyone present here in the audience as students. In this session, I, uh, I would like to give my, uh, my observations and experiences in uh, student intellectual property and the commercialization process. Uh, notice these are my observations, my experiences. Um, and um, I have no background in business, I have no background in law, and so I had to teach myself. And so whatever you see here in this presentation is basically what I picked up uh, while going along. Uh, furthermore, this presentation is based on uh, my degree in chemistry science, engineering is different. So when you get into university as a student, uh, you will get a research topic of your supervisor and with a lot of work you will uh, generate uh, data and these data in turn will be incorporated in a publication. These uh, publications then will allow you to get your degree. In addition, these publications uh, will allow your supervisor to uh, get further funding to continue the research. Uh, and with a little bit of luck, it, the ideas you have been generating as a student, with or without your supervisor, will generate intellectual property. Now, as a result of the economic situation and the continuous pressure on universities, uh, there is this drive towards commercialization of intellectual property of universities. Uh, for this, the technology transfer uh, office has been uh, invented. And uh, the technology transfer office basically tries to license the IP that has been generated within the university. Um, unfortunately, uh, this does not work that, that good. Uh, most technology transfer offices make a loss, cost a lot of money. Uh, for, to give you an idea, 1% of all university licensed uh, in, in intellectual property actually generates more than a than million dollars. These, these are uh, US uh, data, by the way. Um, instead, universities, at, some of universities at this moment are trying to focus on knowledge transfer. Uh, knowledge transfer is more student-centered. The idea here is, is that you basically use the IP generated at the university, give it to the students, let them try to, to uh, commercialize that, let them start up companies. So this is actually where student IP becomes important. Now, um, before I continue about st student intellectual property, there are basically two approaches towards intellectual property. The first is the emotional approach. It's mine, I invented it, it's worth millions. 
This is totally the wrong approach. For any student who wants to go this way, forget about it. The point is when you are emotionally involved in your intellectual property, you will make the wrong decisions. You need to make rational decisions on your intellectual property to continue. Another approach is the economical approach. What does it cost, IP? Uh, what does it bring me and when? And what are the risks involved? I mean, you can get IP, but you cannot get your degree. I mean, we just heard an example of that, where that becomes a problem. Uh, or you can't get funding. You have IP, but what is the meaning of it? So from a student perspective, there are a lot of questions here, uh, like what is IP? Uh, what are your rights as a student? Um, what is the actual value of your IP? Uh, how to turn IP into money? And the point is, within a university structure, you will not get any answers. This is my personal experience. Why do you do not get any answers to these questions? Well, simply, your teacher is not interested in IP, or your teacher doesn't understand IP. What is also occurring is that your teacher doesn't want to educate you because I own all the IP that is generated in my labs using my funding. And this also covers any revenue that is being generated. Now, I find in general that the majority of faculty finds in cat uh, falls in categories A and C. So what this means then is that I will try to answer some of these questions by myself. So let's first have a look at what is the actual value of intellectual property. Well, intellectual property has a, um, an emotional value, right? You finally got your patent, you, you have been working through all this stuff. This is very interesting. It looks good on your CV. But what is most important here and what everyone should realize is that there is a latent commercial value to IP. And with latent, I mean you didn't sell anything. You have a piece of paper, that's it. Um, the majority of IP, the majority of patented IDs will never make any money. And finally, it is also so that the inventor possibly will need deep financial pockets in order to deal with infringement. You can make money on your patent, but if someone else is going to make it, what are you going to do about it? So the baseline and reality check here is that the market, the buyers, will decide the value of your IP. You have to realize that as a student because it puts everything in a different perspective. A patent does not bring you money. So what about, what about uh, student intellectual property rights? Well, it is, I'm sorry to tell you that from my perspective, students have IP rights, but they won't get it in a university setting. Well, why is that? Um, it has to do with these supervisors and teachers we were just talking about a moment ago. So how can you approach this? Well, what you can do is you can do it yourself. You go into IP law and you will learn lots of new and very interesting and exciting stuff while you apply for patent. However, there are two bottlenecks here. The first bottleneck is your supervisor. Now, you have to do a reality and an honesty check there. Did you really invent this? Or did your supervisor, was your supervisor involved in the actual invention? If that's the case, you will have to talk to him and you will have to talk to a lawyer. There is no way around that. An altogether other reality is, however, your supervisor or teacher tells you that he is a co-inventor simply because you are in his lab. This is incorrect. However, it does mean at that moment that you will have to be sure that your lab notebooks are properly kept. They need to be dated, they need to be signed, they need to be countersigned, and they need to show a clear flow of thought towards that uh, IP. Furthermore, and this is an insider information, and I hope you never have to go there, but you have to realize that all teachers at the university are in fact living in a glass cage. You can get access to all information they have on you that contains your name through the Freedom of Information Act. Again, I hope that you never have to use this. Now, um, you have dealt with your supervisor, now you have to deal with the university. As I uh, said, the university uh, often is involved in technology transfer, and so um, you will have to tell them that you are applying for IP. Now, if you have a, a cooperative supervisor, there is no problem there. You just go to an office, you tell them what you are doing, and at that moment, the system takes over from you, and probably you won't learn very much of the IP process and the possibility of commercializing, maybe, maybe not. In case of a non-cooperative supervisor, the situation becomes much more complex. The problem here is, is that in order to deal with university, you want confidentiality. And I can tell you, you won't get it. 
You can pay fees at the university, but you cannot trust the university with your IP. So at this point, when you reach this point, I suggest ignore the university guidelines, go it alone, forget about it. At a certain moment, you will get into trouble, but deal with it when it comes. Let's face it, most of the time, your IP is not going to make any money anyhow. So let's look at the next process, which is the commercialization step. I'm not going to talk very much about it, simply because I have not been very successful in this corner. However, I do notice a consistent set of errors coming up time and time again. I'm not going into them, but I would like to point out that if you go into commercialization as a student, the commercialization process is a 24-7 job. You cannot just do that in addition to doing your PhD or your master's degree. So be aware that you will have to make this, this decision at a certain moment when you go this way. So what about the situation here at York University? Well, I have a good story and I have an ugly story. The bad stories I don't have yet, but I will get them in due time. So the good story is a Schulich School of Business uh, graduate goes to science and engineering building, talks to some faculty there uh, about some unclear business ideas. He is being sent to the postdocs in that, in that building, starts up a conf uh, conversation, ideas are generated, a business plan is created, and um, a startup company results. This is a good plan. A bad plan, uh, a bad situation is a supervisor wants to sell his intellectual property to a company. Well, uh, students are being told, you won't get a degree unless you sign away your IP rights. Well, first of all, that will have some implications for the quality of the IP that is being generated there. And there may be also some liability questions there. These kind of stories are circulating at York University. And I don't know how good that is for a supervisor. So what are the actual points then here, the, the issues from my perspective and on the basis of my experiences? First of all, the teaching. It is very important that both faculty as well as students are being taught intellectual property law as well as um, entrepreneurial skills. The second thing is that we need to find some way of dealing with the student-supervisor uh, interaction. Is this competitive or is this cooperative? Finally, the university itself will have to make up its mind which direction do we want to go. Do we want to go to tech transfer or do we want to go in the direction of knowledge transfer. Thank you for your attention. Great. All right, well, that'll certainly give us some things to talk about. Thanks, Eric. <laughs> uh, and now, uh, uh, following on uh, Dr. Verkeck's excellent recommendation, we have Mr. Haparachi, who in fact is in law school now, and so is taking this very seriously to heart that he should learn IP. Uh, so he has a bachelor and a master's in applied science and engineering from University of Waterloo. Uh, and is the co-founder of Draw Express Inc., director of emerging technologies at Admiris Payment Systems. Uh, and he has, gee, just a bunch of technical expertise. <laughs> Embedded systems, cryptography, software design, biomedical engineering. Uh, now, as I said, he's here at Osgoode Law School and will be uh, doing a summer position at Bereskin and Parr, a leading Canadian IP law firm. So tell us about your experiences. Thanks so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so um, as some of you know, I'm actually finishing up my uh, second year at Osgoode uh, right now, but I have been involved in uh, startups in the past and still am. Um, so, I mean, the focus of my discussion today is going to be about um, entrepreneurship in the high-tech industry um, and also academic um, research. Um, so in terms of, um, uh, you know, my academic uh, research background, I, um, as was mentioned, I uh, did my undergrad and master's at, uh, at Waterloo and, you know, it was a, it was a great experience. Um, I, but I think, you know, any student who's in that kind of um, research um, environment, you know, they really need to be aware of what their rights are. And, uh, and you know, Udo did an amazing job at you know, describing uh, some of the issues with uh, you know, the rights and the roadblocks that you may um, encounter. I'm not gonna go into as much detail as he did, but uh, you know, I'll give my own uh, personal experience with that. Um, you know, so speaking of um, you know, policies with respect to IP, I think um, you know, Waterloo has one of some of the best policies out there. Um, essentially, like all the inventions that students make, um, and the faculty as well, um, are pretty much theirs. The university have uh, no claim um, over that. 
uh, by default. So I mean, essentially, the whole idea is that you know they want to promote a certain culture of um, uh, you know entrepreneurship um, and attract um, faculty and uh, students who have the same kind of. Um, um, entrepreneurial uh, goals, I suppose. Um, I mean, this is beneficial for the university as well. Um, the more startups, successful startups there are, you know, it enhances the reputation of the university as well. Um, and I think Waterloo has, um, like, the largest number of successful startups um, in, a high, in the high tech industry um, that's uh, tied to the universities. Um, so, um, and um, you know, so I, I think from students' perspective, that's really important um, to have that kind of freedom, knowing that you know what you are working on uh, and what you are inventing. Um, you know, you have the opportunity to commercialize that yourself, and you know, hopefully, be successful later on. Um, and but if you do need help um, with commercialization, uh, Waterloo does have a commercialization office, which will help you with the whole. Uh, you know the the process of doing that. I, I think they keep like a 25% uh, you know cut uh, for their efforts, which I think is you know reasonable under the circumstances. But you know you're not in any obligation to actually uh, you know take up on that offer. Um, so and another reality um, of doing academic research is that um, you know uh, in terms of like um, external uh, funding from companies and such, um, there might be a, like a great research opportunity where. Um, like external entity, like a, in the industry, might approach the university and say, um, you know, we'll give you this much funding. Um, we need research done. In which case, um, um, of course, um, you know, it'll be great for the university as well. But the expectation will be that you know the company might want to retain ownership of the IP. Um, I guess the whole point of all this is that when you go into research, you have to know what your rights are, um, and that's very important. Um, you know, you may have. You know, ownership right in whatever you are working on, you or you may have nothing, and that's a discussion I think that you should have uh, before actually you know joining the group and uh, you know doing a research on that. Um, different universities have different policies. I mean, my personal experience is only with Waterloo, but I'm but I know that some other universities don't have the same policies. So you should always always find out what those policies are. Um, and um, you know, Udo, um, you know, uh, talked about this uh, before. Um, you know, when you are in an academic institution. Um, you know, the focus is on, um, you know, that's a huge focus on publications and, you know, that's obviously, you know, uh, should be your priority because, I mean, you're doing research um, and that will in turn help uh, your supervising prof get even more funding. But, you know, based on my personal experience, um, I feel like there isn't as much of a focus in that setting on, um, on getting patents and, uh, you know, the, getting your intellectual property rights protected. Um, it might be a lack of education, um, you know, on the part of the students themselves, or lack of motivation by the supervising prof uh, him or herself. Uh, and I think, you know, that focus uh, needs to, um, you know, change a bit. And uh, you know, Silvan um, at the beginning, um, you know, he talked about how, um, you know, 84% of, uh, you know, businesses, um, you know, don't pursue the IP aspect as much as they should. Um, you know, you know, there may be a lot of IP sitting on university desks which are not. Uh, you know, that are not part of businesses, um, so that might not even be captured in those stats um, and are not pursued. So those stats might even be worse in that sense. Um, and also, as a final observation on that, you know, when you do a master's, you're going to be spending like one to two years, um, yeah, you know, doing research. If it's a PhD, three to five years. Um, I knew one guy who spent like eight years doing his PhD. I think he's finally done, I hope. Um, and uh, so, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge, huge investment of time. Um, obviously, I mean, if there are many, many different areas of study, including mathematics and sciences, which may not have a direct patentable um, uh, focus, and, you know, that's completely fine, you know, it's for the betterment of society, like pursuing those kind of uh, research activities are very commendable, but if you also have an entrepreneur uh, spirit, if you will, um, I think you should, you know, give a bit of thought as to what you're getting yourself into, and giving that initial, um, you know, thought as to the type of research that you're going into uh, may be, you know, worthwhile. Um, for example, I mean, if, if you're going into a research area where, um, you know, it's a very saturated market, and, you know, even if you succeed with your research, if the chance of, uh, you know, you making an impact um, is very low, the chances are even if it's successful research, you won't really um, you know, make much money um, once you're done. So I think that requires um, some thought. Um, in terms of entrepreneurship, um, you know, I, I uh, 
started my, I was, I was part of my first startup um, right after my undergrad, me and a few friends, we uh, got together and we started a company um, uh, related to uh, mobile uh, financial payments. And you know there are significant challenges. You know when you when you first uh, start a company, um, for one thing, you need to actually make the product. A lot of research and development that goes into that. Um, you need to approach VCs for funding, and most importantly, you need to get uh, clients, of course. Um, and um, you know when you approach VCs, I mean one of the first questions they will ask you is who are your clients? Complete reasonable question. I mean they are essentially giving you money, um, spending a lot of time with you, resources on you. Um, and that's a very fair question, but you know, depending on uh, the type of product you are working on, you may need more funding to actually get that uh, you know, initial set of clients. Um, and uh, you know, so I mean, it can be a bit of a uh, chicken or the egg kind of situation, so you have to be you know, a bit more adaptable in how you approach that. Um, you know, one thing you can do, for example, is um, you can approach uh, your university and you know, try to get them um, as maybe a potential client, or at least you know, uh, target the university um, student population. I mean, that's the approach that we used. Um, for example, I think Facebook, you know, they use the same kind of approach, and many other companies you know, do that. Um, and that has starts in universities. Um, and um, and uh, you know, another very important thing is that you should um, you know, make sure that your inventions are protected by IP. Um, and uh, you know that will help with your negotiations with VCs as well. Even if you don't have many clients, you can always go to them and say, you know, I have this, um, you know, patent portfolio, um, you know, you know, and that makes your case even more compelling in that sense. Um, and um, I think um, another huge consideration with respect to um, um, you know innovation is the market readiness of your product, um, and that's something that we had to deal with um, early on as well. If, if the market knows there's a problem and you have a solution for it, you know, going to a VC is you know, that much easier. I mean, you say, you know, here's a problem, here's a solution, please give me some money. You know, it's well, much more than that, but it's, you know, it's an easier case to make. Um, if the market is not ready for your product, you also have to need to convince them that even though um, you know, there's no uh, you know, demand for it right now, there will be in a few years' time. And that makes it um, even uh, you know, a bit more complicated. And um, I mean, so you know, just going back to IP, um, I think you know, obviously, IP like having a patent um, has obvious benefits of uh, you know, offensive and defensive aspects to it, and also you know, helping in getting VC funding. But I think um, you know, when you're when you're successful and you want to negotiate, uh, maybe with a big player in terms of a buyout, um, that can help in that sense as well. Um, you know, there's always a consideration of like a big company coming and you know, just making whatever you did from scratch. Um, if you have uh, the, the expertise to, you know, the, the expertise in the field, the customers, and a, and a very good patent portfolio, you know, that'll make it that much uh, more compelling for the uh, big player to actually, you know, pay you the money that you want um, when you sell the company. Um, so, so in that sense, you know, IP can have many benefits uh, to a startup. Um, and um, you know, in terms of actual development, you know, I, I was personally fortunate enough to know, you know, many engineers in different fields. Um, you know that uh, that I could work with in, in, in the different um, you know entrepreneurial activities that I was uh, interested in, uh, but you know if, if if you have a good idea but you don't have um, you know no you know, enough people to help you make it, I mean obviously the first thing you should do is try to seek out you know local talent uh, to do that. But another consideration is you know outsourcing uh, some of that work. Um, but you know you have to be very really careful when you do that. I have a couple of friends who are doing that right now, and um, you know one of them got, got burned pretty badly uh, recently. You know he spent like probably close to a year, um, you know, conversing with, uh, you know, essentially, you know, some engineers in like Asia, and, uh, you know, he would talk to them a few times every week, and, you know, it didn't go anywhere. Um, essentially, he didn't even get what he was promised. Um, and, you know, you have to be very careful um, when you do um, things like that. Um, and, uh, you know, as a final note, I mean, another trend that pretty prominent these days in the industry is, uh, you know, developing um, to like the, the app stores like, you know, Apple and, um, you know, uh, Blackberry and uh, um, Android, etc. I mean, that's something that I'm involved in uh, right now as well. And the nice thing about that kind of work is that, um, you know, it's, it's very, it's some, you know, many times it's very quick to make and you have a direct interaction, uh, you know, with the actual, uh, you know, the end customer, you know, it's just direct sales into the customer, so you can access a large customer base very easily. So that's, you know, something um, that, you know, that might be of interest to uh, many people. 
Um, and as a final, final note, I mean, you know, there are uh, many law students, I think, um, in this uh, room right now, and many of you are going to be lawyers um, um, eventually. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, regardless of whether it's in IP or not, you're going to, you know, come face to face with many startups um, over their lifetime. And I think it'll be very, you know, beneficial to both to you and your clients to make sure that, um, you know, they have their IP rights protected. And, uh, you know, that's something that people don't, um, you know, spend enough uh, time on, so you should always encourage them to uh, spend the time to talk to a professional and uh, make sure their rights are protected. Thank you. Great. Okay, so we have just about 15 minutes to uh, do some questions, and we have some directed questions first for the panelists, and then we'll open it up to the, the floor if anyone else wants to ask questions. So I'm with Dr. Niazi. I want to follow up a little more on this, a uh, little bit of the, the tension between being an entrepreneur and finishing your degree program. Uh, do you, you know, so the, the first part is, do you see it as an either or? Uh, that you're either going to do one or the other. And um, if not, if you're going to try to combine them, how do you keep both things on track? Uh, actually, I want both of them. <laughs> <laughs> I want to have PhD as well as a big successful company, but uh, I find out that is very difficult because of the following reason. Uh, first, when you start up a company, you need to be involved in the company as a full-time person, and it's not even full-time, it's a full-day person. I'm working 15 hours, or more than 15 hours, like maybe 20 hours a day, you know, working on the company, product development, managing and stuff, and uh, because it's a startup and it needs lots of effort. And uh, behind this, when you go for the investors, the first question that they are asking is, what is your position in the company? Are you working full-time or part-time? Are you still a student? They don't invest in a company that inventor actually is working as a part-time or whenever he has time or she has time in the company, involved in the company. So basically, I don't have any time to continue my PhD at this time, and that's why I got leave of absence. It's almost one year, more than one year that I'm in leave of absence. Uh, the other reason that I don't think that I can get back to my PhD right now is patenting issue. Actually, uh, the algorithm is really is a back-end algorithm. It means that uh, when we wanted to provide a patenting strategy, uh, you know, when you do patenting, the patent is published in a year, and you have only one year a competitive age to do whatever you can that and uh, you can do. And after that, all of the competitors uh, can read your patent, twist it, and do something similar to your work. So basically, we decided not to put the secret sauce on the patent, and basically, the patent is just a business model or business process. And even, so basically, I'm, I'm telling you that you can never publish, actually, I can never publish my, my algorithm or finish my PhD because everything is in the patent, and I don't have anything else to publish, you know? So basically, if I want to continue my PhD, I have to start something new. Well, no, when, once, if the patent issues, then it's publicly disclosed, you're saying, so then you can do your, no, finish off your the dissertation. The problem is that I didn't put my algorithm in patent, so even basically, so when I, patent is published in a year, right? Yeah, yeah. But because not my, I didn't put my algorithm in the patent, so doesn't matter is it published or not, basically I can never talk about my algorithm anywhere else or put it in my thesis, because even I didn't put it to the patent to protect it. Oh, oh, I see, I see. So you ended up not, you're not putting that part in the patent itself. Exactly. Okay, I'm sorry, I misunderstood yeah. that. Okay, so you're keeping it as a trade secret, essentially. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, so that's a very good point. So when you, you're gonna uh, keep things un under trade secrecy, which is a really valuable strategy, exactly. uh, you know, and there may still be ways that you can try, well, I guess if you have to save the actual algorithm. That's no way. Position. I should okay. have started new Well, I can't solve your problem, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> if I can comment here, um, there are mechanisms uh, which allow you to write your, uh, your thesis and keep it uh, under wraps, so not published. So you have to talk to your supervisor about that. It is possible to write your thesis, but not get but, it published. But when you publish the thesis, yeah. is it public domain, right? Uh, at that point, yes. But again, you can keep it uh, out of the public domain for, for quite some time, I think. Well, I think the idea here is that you, you need to, and obviously I don't know the policies here, but you need to talk to your supervisor about whether you can not do that formal step of, of even sort of a, technically publishing it with your university library. 
right? A lot of schools, well, that's the last that. step, is that it technically goes into the university's library and it's available through master's and thesis, so if, you know, if in doctoral. This is the choice, that's great, yeah. because I was talking about this yeah. problem with many people and I couldn't find any solution. Yeah. But if there is a chance to do that, basically, yeah. maybe I can. Yeah. Oh, I don't know if they're right, right, but that may be, that may be, maybe. Yeah. Uh, so, Dr. Brickett, now I know you have you know, very strong views, which is very interesting positions you brought up. Uh, um, so, but let's think about how you could constructively try to work on the relationship between students and the university. I mean, you, you've raised the problems, and those are all valid problems. But now, you know, do you have one or two ideas about how we could make the relationship work better? Uh, well, I, I think the, the, the basis should be integrity in the end, and integrity and openness. I mean, these are the two keywords. And unfortunately, uh, a system has grown uh, where you basically have the supervisors or teachers that are totally separate from that of the students. The other thing is, of course, is that I feel that there is a total lack of education here as far as uh, IP law is concerned, uh, as well as the entrepreneurial process is concerned. I mean, people in general, and this is both supervisors as well as students, seem to think that the moment when you have IP, the money will start coming in. Sorry, in the actual commercialization process, the IP is something like 1%. Right? I mean, it, it, it's really, an, in fact, for a startup company, it's nice if you can build it around your IP, but often it is something that comes much later in the process. So that kind of knowledge is, is totally lacking at the faculty level. And I'm, I'm talking here about science and technology, um, and even more of an em emphasis here on the science side of things. So I, I think we need to work on, on, on education, and I mean, it, it will take a lot of conflict away once, once people start realizing what we're actually talking about here. Well, that seems solvable. I think it would be interesting. We have our, uh, from the you know, university academic perspective, uh, you know, maybe there are some things that the university is already considering uh, ways to do. I know at certain universities, I may talk about this a little bit in my uh, presentation after this, um, University of Washington, we do do a fairly robust job about having sessions to train uh, and to just educate uh, students and faculty about the IP process, about commercialization. Uh, so, so this may be something that actually is, is quite yeah, fixable. Yeah, I, I, I do know that, for instance, at Oxford, uh, uh, it's basically mandatory for, for students in the sciences to, to go through these courses yeah. of, of uh, entrepreneurship and, and uh, IP. Good, good. I mean, that should be possible here as well. That's right. Okay, so, Mr. Haparachi, let's, um, what would you like to see in changes in the patent system then to help the kinds of startups you've been involved in? Not all the um, changes, maybe just one or two. Right. Um, <laughs> I, I would say, I mean, in terms of, um, in terms of, I, th I think one of the biggest um, concerns out there over the current patent system, I mean, just a general trend in the industry, I suppose, um, you know, has to do with, um, you know, the current standard of um, obviousness or the unobviousness standard. Um, essentially, you know, whether an invention is inventive enough, if you will, uh, to actually get a uh, patent um, in the system, um, you know, it's, it's a very tough question. I mean, it's something that you know the courts have struggled with for a for a very long time, and and I, I would imagine even to this date, um, you know, in the current system, we have, um, you know, if you if you meet that standard and you meet other requirements, you know, you'll get a patent for um, you know 20 years. If you don't, then you'll get nothing. So it's a all or nothing kind of approach, um, and you know. I think that might uh, be, um, you know, one of the, um, you know, issues in terms of, you know, what makes the, the, the question so complicated in terms of whether something is inventive enough. One possibility to that may be, um, you know, having sort of like a variable term uh, patent uh, kind of thing that may be um, like a function of the actual inventiveness. I mean, that's another difficult problem to solve in terms of how do you actually tie the inventiveness uh, to a you know length of a patent, um, you know, and there are certain international obligations as well um, in terms of uh, you know um, I think um, you know a minimum requirement uh, in terms of the length of the patent. But many countries out there, like I think Germany and uh, France, for example, they have uh, uh, like different ca classes of protection, like utility models, for example, that are less than 20 years. Um, you know, that's not necessarily tied to uh, the inventiveness per se, but sort of like with different requirements. And uh, you know, this also goes to the point that Sullivan was talking about in terms of how long it takes for a patent to be um, um, issued. Um, you know, with something like that, with like utility model, um, you know, you can get sort of like you know fast examination at least on the formal requirements, and the substantive examination is done later. Um, I suppose during litigation. 
um, you know, that kind of system may be tied with like um, the actual inventiveness might be one proposal that might be investigated and may deserve some merit, I think. Okay, and follow up on the uh, Commissioner Laporte was uh, saying, what, what about uh, an idea about having one claim per patent? I think, you know, <laughs> It would be nice, it would be nice, but uh, you know, I, I guess in practice, I mean, essentially you try to you know, claim the broadest protection possible. I mean, when you're uh, trying to uh, get protection for your invention or your client's invention, um, and you know, it's impractical, I think, you know, in practice to you know, make sure that you know, your, your single claim is you know, completely free of any uh, prior art issues and such, so you can try to claim it you know, pretty broad and then sequentially you try to narrow your claim so that even, just even you know, at, at later litigation, if that you know, broad claim is struck down, you still have you know, some, right. some protection. So I think, I think um, you know, while it's desirable, I think in practice, um, you know, I, I think many good patents sort of like, you know, follow that flow with like general claim and narrow claims, and I, think, I don't think you can avoid that. Well, I think uh, Commissioner Laporte's still in the room. Oh, yes. So on the, the single claim uh, idea, were you thinking about it as, as one independent claim and then maybe allowing dependent claims? Or, or would it truly be just one claim with no narrowing independent, uh, dependent claims? Oh yeah, so somebody can uh, uh, give him a microphone. Sorry to put you on the spot too, but I... Hmm? Yeah, they were gonna, yeah, exactly. I get used to being put on the spot. Um, <laughs> Don't take the one claim example as a, uh, as a true recommendation. It's illustrative of the yeah. fact that we need to simplify the claim so we can get to a decision as soon as possible. When we get 189 claims, you know, uh, 10 independent and the rest are independent, it takes a whole you know, sure. different approach to, to uh, uh, examining the, uh, the application. Um, we do, in fact, uh, about 12 to 15 percent of the applications we receive get approved from the first reading. There's no letters, there's no cycle, it goes straight into a grant. Those tend to be the more simpler type of, uh, of application. So um, what I was trying to convey was in, in trying to meet the small businesses' requirements of going fast, one of the things we need to consider is simplifying the application itself, right? So if the interest of the, of the business person who is doing the application is not about um, you know, getting the, 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 having the claims give you the biggest fences possible and, and playing the, 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 uh, um, um, to the, the, the royalty game, right? Um, but it's give me my piece of paper as soon as possible because I have other interests than royalties. Well then, you know, using one claim or two claims, but keeping it very, very simple is the point I was trying to get. Simplicity leads to speed. Right. Yeah, I was being a little provocative, trying to narrow it down to just one claim, but, but I think that what we, we see like is that. That, that, you know, spectrum, right, between just, you know, pages and pages of claims, dependent, independent, and then sort of a, a overly simplistic one claim here. And so now the question is, how can we bring it into the middle to both, uh, to have the more efficiency in the process while still allowing for some, you know, wiggle room with inventive space? Mm -hmm. And that's what I meant by, you know, a different value proposition. So there's what we do today where we try to get the biggest fence as possible and we have a market, a captured market of the 15% of the companies. That doesn't seem to satisfy the value proposition and expectations of the other piece of the market, which is the 85% that do not use IP, right? So at, at some point, we need to, to, to develop a different approach, a different looking, a different way of looking at the value proposition. It's very different. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Now, questions from the floor. Hi, Udo. Um, I'm David Phipps. I'm the Executive Director of Research and Innovation Services. Could you flip back a couple of slides, please? Let's see if I can do that. Oops, no, I just hit the wrong thing. That's an arrow, but it didn't really do it. Let me know, do I hit the arrow keys? Oh, no, okay. Yeah, see the arrow, see why is it, uh, does this not go backwards? Michelle's okay. yeah, taking care the back of it. arrow just takes you into the, it's like a right click. Yeah, go back, 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 that one. Uh, go forward. Where's the one where you have, uh, just ignore the policies? That's the one. Um, so my T4 has a big York logo on it. I don't get to ignore policies. So, you know, since we're doing taxes at this time, 
you just might want to check to see if yours also has a York logo. But that aside, I want to talk about two things, um, knowledge transfer and the good, the bad, and the ugly. So you said at the end that we need to make a choice between knowledge transfer and technology transfer. And I don't think those two are mutually exclusive. I think the two can coexist. York is Canada's leading knowledge mobilization university. That means we have chosen knowledge, transfer, knowledge mobilization and tech transfer, and we support them both under a broad rubric of connecting research to impact. And we do that, so as Canada's leading knowledge mobilization university, I'll be talking about that in my panel session a little bit, we do that while we're still supporting Razia and KPOC, or Engage Biomechanics, or Palomino Innovation Systems, new mindsets. So the two can coexist. So I don't think universities need to make a choice between knowledge transfer and technology transfer. I think the two can coexist. And also good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, yeah, with everything, there's good, there's bad, and there's ugly. But anecdotes are no substitute for evidence. And the evidence is that our students, like Razia, are creating IP. And they're creating good IP, and the university is creating services that helps connect students and our faculty with industry and with organizations that are seeking to create impact, whether that's through products and services through IP. And that research, like as Razia said, is an integral part of her experience. So I don't think we need to make her choose knowledge transfer or technology transfer. I think at York we can celebrate these, we can support these, and while we can do that while being compliant with our policies and our procedures. Other questions? It's uh, this gentleman first and then... Uh Hi, uh, <clears throat> David Liberté from uh, Microsoft. Um, I actually have a question for uh, Dr. Vervik. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name properly. Um, and it ties into the comment of the gentleman just before. Uh, I'm curious about the approach of Canadian universities in particular, because uh, I think it's slightly different in the United States, and maybe Mr. Professor Connor can talk about that. But my understanding, uh, I'd, I'd like to, to get a better understanding of um, to what extent do technology transfer offices or Canadian universities in general assist researchers and students uh, who, prov who develop you know, new inventions, um, and, and actually those that do choose to get IP for that and get a patent, um, to actually go out in the industry and license it and essentially get partnerships and, 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 and as opposed to them taking on the whole product commercialization and product development um, aspect themselves. To what extent is that actually happening in Canadian universities? Uh, you know that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it hand-holding, but at least um, assisting of students to actually connect them with industry. Uh, well, first of all, I would like to make a clear distinction here between the sciences and engineering. Yeah. Uh, it's my impression that in engineering, this, this um, uh, flow from, from IP into industry is much easier than it is in the sciences, especially when you are talking about fundamental science, right? You, you tackle a certain fundamental scientific problem, and all of a sudden you realize, wait a moment, there's something here that is patentable. You can do something with it. Um, then you get into this problem, how is your supervisor going to react? Now, with regard to student IP, um, I have not seen any clear examples in reading the literature, in talking to students, that the universities are actually actively involved at the science side of things in bringing this to the market. Um, why that is, I don't know. I think it has to do with the fact that, again, faculty have an awful lot of power to suppress any opinions of students. And there is a reason why you don't see a lot of students here talking about their experiences. Simply because usually it is at the cost of the careers, right? And so um, there is this, this huge cloud hanging over this whole, whole topic. And that is simply that if, as a student, you dare to bring up this point with your supervisor, you're bound to get trouble. Now, I went all the way, right? And this, this I really hope that no one has to go through these kind of things. But it clearly indicates that the universities, as far as from the science side of things is concerned, is not willing to openly consider the possibility that students actually are actively involved in inventing things. It's just not part of, of uh, the ideas that are circulating. And I mean, I can hear that from your side as well. It just does not, my message just does not arrive. And I 
I'm wondering if uh, in the coming discussions with other faculty members, we will see this again and again. The students are not being involved in this. It's the faculty who does the invention. It's the faculty that are getting supported by law, by the way, because it seems to be the case that when you bring these things into court, the um, uh, supervisor in general is considered as the inventor, not the student, right? This is all the original uh, teacher-student relationship. And I don't think this will work very well with regard to uh, commercialization of research at the university. Now, uh, let's, let's put this all in proper perspective. It really doesn't matter because the students will find their way anyhow. It is the universities that would like to tap into this. Again, I talk to some of my fellow students, some of them who are in the process of starting up business, and they say, well, don't bother with it. It's really not worth your trouble. And I fear that at the end of the day, I will come with the same conclusion from a science point of view. From an engineering point of view, it's different. It's a different story altogether. Okay, so my next statement, I want to give you a chance to respond, and, right. and you can also go to the next panel, so I'm hoping you'll uh, uh, go into this uh, quite a bit. But I want to uh, have your comment first, and then I think we, because we want to try to get back onto our, our schedule, too, since we started a little late. Um, so just disclosure, I, too, am from a tech technology transfer office. I am uh, the director of uh, um, applied Research and Commercialization um, at uh, Ryerson University. I'm also Ryerson University's legal counsel. Um, I, I have a question, but just to respond um, that to the thought that universities don't support commercialization out of science, um, specifically commercialization out of science from the student's point of view, um, just to give you Ryerson's perspective, we just awarded um, 30 commercialization fellowships to students, current and recent graduates, um, who are commercializing intellectual property that they've developed um, both on their own and in Ryerson Labs. And 80% of those commercialization fellowships went to students in the sciences. Um, so I, th I think you might have had a bad experience um, but I think especially if you look at um, what Sylvan was saying, that uh, the majority of patents coming out of Canadian universities are coming out of chemistry, um, that it's not necessarily the case for the whole of the university or the whole of the university system in Canada. Um, my question is this, and it, it, it's, it's to all of you as students, and um, it was brought up kind of um, a little bit um, by each of you. And it has to do with the role of the university in supporting you when you commercialize inventions. Um, and again, this is, this is just something that's happened in our office with increasing frequency. I don't know if it's been happening in yours or any other tech transfer offices. Um, but we've been having students that come into our office and say, I want to own my own intellectual property. Um, I don't want the university involved. Um, I don't want the university to take a share. Um, and we say, okay, that's fine. Um, at Ryerson, we take a 10% share. Um, and then they say, okay, so how are you gonna support me? <laughs> and what money are you gonna give me to file my patents? And what advice are you going to provide to me and, hey, can you write a, um, a license agreement for me and start up my company? And I say, but you don't want me involved and you don't want us to make any decisions and you don't even want us to take our 10%. Um, why, why should the university be putting resources, tech transfer resources, into helping you do this? Um, at Ryerson, we have a very, very strong incubator culture and a very strong student innovation culture um, through not only our digital media zone, but other zones that we're creating where we're, we're giving student companies four months free to start with a lot of support. Um, and yet we, we are, as an institution, always getting that kind of why should the university share in, in what I'm doing and why should the university um, be entitled to any um, influence or control um, or reward from what happens. Um, so I just want your opinions on that. You've, you've kind of run the gamut, it seems, from 
um, different university policies and different levels of support. So just any opinions that you might have on that, I think would be uh, really useful and insightful. I have a question. I, I would ask our panelists to keep it relatively brief, though, because we're almost out of time. Um, I'm going to answer. You well, want to answer? Order. Oh, okay. okay, so actually I had full support from York University and uh, I had actually option that even if I want to commercialize it without supporting York University, I had this option, but I didn't choose this, uh, choose this option because uh, I know this area needs lots of expertise, and if I wanted to be fast and start up my company very fast and commercialization process very fast, I need some support from expertise that in this area. So uh, I uh, immediately rejected this object, but York University was very supportive in terms of uh, and the percentage that actually de depends on the patenting. I had choice for licensing my algorithm or starting up a company and different percentage. And the percentage was really, actually, I surprised because it was really good. And uh, like 5% is, is nothing really for all of their support. Uh, and also, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> the other thing is that uh, actually what was, uh, I, the reason that I encouraged to commercialize my work is that when I ask who owns IP in York University, uh, Hassan told me that uh, inventor owns the IP, and this is very good because I know in many university, university owns the IP, not researcher or a student. Sorry, we don't take any assignment. It's uh, the ownership still lies with the inventor. We're certainly the agent. And um, even if, uh, and to your point, uh, at York University, if an inventor decides to go on their own, the university takes nothing. Doesn't even add ten percent, zero percent. So it's really, if they want to come, we're here to help. And um, you've had a great experience, and thank you very much for for mentioning that. I guess I mean, from the uh, perspective of uh, Waterloo, um, you know, essentially, I mean, by default, they don't take. Um, any kind of cut, um, just I guess for policy reasons, in terms of for that extra level of uh, you know uh, motivation, sort of like you know come to the university um, uh, to do entrepreneurial work. Uh, but that being said, I think if a university wants to take a certain cut, I don't think it's unreasonable. I mean, a student is using the resources of the university um, for that. So I mean, if a you know, if a particular university wants to take like small cut, I would imagine that's uh, you know that's a reasonable thing to uh, do. Um, but I mean, uh, speaking uh, from the Waterloo's perspective, even even though they don't take a cut, if you do need their, like you know, ask for their help in commercialization in terms of um, applying for a patent management, introductions to uh, the industry, uh, marketing help, etc., um, they take a 25% cut, um, which you know I think under the circumstances, if you need that kind of guidance, I don't think uh, that's unreasonable amount. So I mean, that's just my perspective. Um, yeah, so, so first of all, with, uh, with remark to um, what, what I would call the lunatic fringe that comes in, yeah, it, it is, uh, this is a question of education, right? I mean, if students really don't understand the intellectual uh, uh, property uh, process, don't understand the um, entrepreneurial process, yeah, then I guess you will get these students that, that uh, I don't want you to be involved, but how do I get the money and things like that. Um, again, I think it's a question of education. Um, mandatory education? I don't know. Um, with regard to, to the involvement uh, of, of the university, um, it seems to me that in both cases, because the university does not own the IP, uh, you basically have put all the, the um, mechanism, an important mechanism in place for, for um, knowledge transfer, actually. And the big question is, however, how does Ryerson uh, deal with, with uh, the relation of uh, supervisor and student? Uh, sure, the student can have IP, but what is the, uh, the role of the supervisor here? Could you say something about that? And, and so, Sal and I are going to address that in our talk. Sorry, Sal and I are okay. going to address that in our talk. Next, the relationship between the supports for students in faculty graduate studies and support for researchers through the research services. But quickly, just um, in terms of your question about Canada. Uh, Canada's made uh, a very clear statement that uh, students working with industry is a very important piece. So our federal funding agencies, NSERC and CHR, both have student industry partnering competitions and MITACs, which is an internship competition uh, 
across Canada, um, specifically matches students up with, with, um, with industry. And the budget last night had extra money given to the funding agencies so that uh, to support student mobility um, and IP mobility out of, out of the university and into industry. So Canada's made a very strong statement that this is an important part of the student experience. Great, great. All right, well, I want to thank uh, the panel. Thank you. So thank you very much. Now we'll take a five minute break. So I'm just gonna cut into the break so I get us back on track. For those of you tweeting, it's hashtag innovation with students. So I encourage you to tweet away. And there are some refreshments outside and see you back here in about five minutes. Thank you. <laughs>